Herkese merhaba, hoş geldiniz. Bugün Çek Cumhuriyeti'nden bir konuşmacımız var. Doktor İvo Kısalın, Güney Bohem Yardım Üniversitesi'nin kendisi tarih mevzusunda. Bugün 1620 Avusturya İmparatoru'na karşı Çek protestan ayaklanması ve Osmanlı konusunda bir konuşma yapacak kendisi. Bu konuşmadan önce kısaca belirtmek isterim ki bu ayaklanmanın 400. yıl dönümü. Evet. Ve aynı zamanda da biliyorsunuz bizim tarih bölümünün 50. E, yıl dönümü. Dolayısıyla iki yıl, yıl dönümünün kesiştiği bir konferans e, olacak bugün. E, çok güzel bir konuda, çok değerli bir e, konuşmacımız e, bize hitap edecek. Başlamadan önce belki Çek Büyükelçisi'ne bir konuşma yapmak ister kısaca. Yes, very briefly. In the world, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are some more uh, audience coming, so please join us. Uh, there are still some free chairs left. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank the leadership of the university, uh, the rector of the dean, uh, and all the counterparts uh, of ours who have been instrumental in making uh, this uh, event uh, happen because the embassy and, and, and myself are very really glad uh, and Mr. Brosh, the uh, political secretary of the embassy uh, who has been actually against of, uh, of uh, this whole event. We've been glad that uh, there has been quite some interest shown into, into what we have offered to uh, uh, several Turkish institutions. Uh, I don't know whether there is any, any need for interpretation, but I think that basically you can understand uh, me uh, and my Czech English. Uh. So uh, um, uh, this is the first point which I would like to make, you know, giving thanks to all of those who, who have uh, uh, helped us uh, uh, to, to see this happen. Uh, secondly, I should uh, uh, tell you that uh, I certainly will not steal the show to, to Dr. Zema. Uh, uh, who will speak for himself, uh, uh, addressing you with the lecture. But uh, I should uh, only tell you, without going into the topic itself, uh, that uh, uh, the early modern age in which Dr. Seban specializes is still a source of uh, lessons for us nowadays. And we will be talking uh, uh, and reflecting a bit on the vital period of, uh, of the European uh, and also of the Czech history, but also of the Ottoman history, uh, and uh, this sort of quite improbable possible connection, which uh, which could have happened, but <coughs> which failed to materialize, uh, may have changed the course of history. But we know that none of us is into the alternative history because there is only the one history which which we know, which we which we uh, analyze. Uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, to me, personally, it's always the why question, right? why things happen. Uh, besides what happened and when, which is also part of, uh, of, of, of uh, history and, and studying it, uh, the why question, I think, is the, is the crucial one. And that is why we, uh, we, we quite like to listen and, and read those historians who can address, who can address this why question at play. And I think that Dr. Zerman uh, definitely meets this uh, criterion and you will be able to, to see for yourselves that that's the case, I hope. And uh, with this, uh, I think I should hand over uh, to Dr. Zerman um, and, and, and, and uh, his lecture to which I will listen with interest. Also, because of one little quite unimportant fact that is that, is that I live in Prague, I live very close to, to the crucial menu, you know, which will be also mentioned in the, in the lecture and which has to do with one, uh, one important battle uh, of, of the Czech uh, uh, history, uh, which could have uh, turned also into uh, a point in Ottoman history, but why it was so that it did not happen. So you will actually learn from the lecture. So with this, I thank you also for your attendance, for your attention. Uh, an interest, and uh, I think that the moment is right to hand over to the Dr. So, thank you. So, thank you for the lecture, for after the lecture. So, I think uh, I'm just handing uh, over the microphone. Okay. Um, 
Dilersen sayınlar için söyleyeyim. Ee, yani tarih ne oldu? Ama aynı zamanda niçin öyle oldu? Bunun çok önemli olduğunu söyledi bence doktor e, sorumunun e, konuşmasından bunu öğreneceğiz. Bu arada ben de konuşmayı hemen devretmeden önce şunu söyleyeyim. Biz bu organizasyonu Çek Cumhuriyeti Büyükelçiliği ile işbirliği halinde Dolayısıyla Sayın Büyükelçi'ye burada e, kendisine e, ve diplomat e, Martin Roş'a teşekkür etmek istiyorum konuşma başlamadan önce. E, bu bize gösterdikleri yakın bilgiler dolayı. Tabi burada dekanımız da burada. O da kendisi de bize bu konuşmanın e, yapılabilmesi için çok büyük destek verdi. Ona da e, teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Doktor Sorma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am glad that so many people here in Turkey are interested in uh, uh, an important event of Czech history, the battle uh, on the White Mountain in 1620, which is considered by many Czechs the major turning point in our modern history. The basic idea is that uh, the Battle of the White Mountain was the, uh, was the loss of our freedom and the beginning of uh, 300 years of tyranny. This was in many ways a misleading idea, but this is an idea which uh, simply is responsible for the uh, importance of the Battle on the White Mountain in the Czech culture. Uh, my mission here is to uh, explore the connections between uh, the Battle on the White Mountain and the, the Czech Revolt and, and the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire, uh, <clears throat> which is a topic which uh, has been neglected by earlier historians, because uh, Czech historians of the 20th century were focused mainly on the relationships between the Czech rebels and Western powers like England, France, uh, the Netherlands. Nobody showed interest in the uh, relations of the Czech rebels to the Ottoman Empire uh, in the East. So I will first of all explain what was actually the Czech Revolt. The Czech Revolt uh, which uh, was finally defeated in the battle on the White Mountain in 1620. Uh, then I will explain what were the personal ties between Czech leaders and the Ottoman Empire. And finally, I will explain in which ways these Czech uh, leaders tried to make contact with uh, the Sultan Osman II and uh, uh, involve uh, Ottoman armies uh, in uh, in uh, the. Uh, Czech revolt. And finally, the crucial question, which has not been answered by earlier historians, is whether the Ottoman Empire finally intervened or not. So you will finally learn that there was something happening, even in the military field. <clears throat> so something really occurred, but unfortunately too late uh, for the revolt to be, to be saved. <clears throat> so, first of all, what was the Czech Revolt of 1618 to 1620? Uh, this, is, uh, this was a rebellion of uh, Czech, mainly Protestant leaders, against the Habsburg dynasty, which was uh, ruling in uh, Czechia at the time. It was triggered uh, by religious oppression. It should be explained that uh, the Czech Revolt uh, had a positive program. It was not a crazy struggle uh, started by some lunatics who had uh, no vision for the future. They had a positive program, and it was based on the <coughs> uh, on the uh, already existing uh, system uh, of uh, uh, prevention uh, against uh, religious uh, strikes, religious uh, struggles, which was based on a bi-confessional court of justice. Uh, which was established to solve uh, religious difficulties and which was uh, established in 1609 in 1609 
uh, during uh, some uh, internal struggles uh, among uh, between, between the members of the Habsburg dynasty, which the Czech leaders exploited for themselves, and uh, they pushed through uh, this idea of establishing a court of justice, which would uh, which would solve religious difficulties in a peaceful way, and which was which would be the foundation for a more tolerant uh, state, more tolerant monarchy. Unfortunately, uh, the Catholics sabotaged this institution. They simply did not participate in the sittings of the biconfessional court. Uh, and shortly before the, the revolt in 1618, the leaders of this uh, biconfessional court, so-called defenses, defenses, they were even threatened uh, <coughs> Uh, on, uh, by, uh, by the Habsburgs because uh, they were threatened to be arrested and uh, even tried as traitors and possibly executed because the Catholics simply uh, considered the activities of this uh, totally illegal uh, court of justice as uh, a threat to uh, the Habsburg rule. So they were sabotaging it and in May 1618 uh, the leaders, uh, the defenses, had quite uh, reliable information that they uh, would be arrested and tried, and they saw for themselves no other remedy than a starting an open rebellion, an open fight. However, they aimed this uh, fight not against the Habsburg Emperor in Vienna, but against his, re his representatives in Prague. So they chose a very peculiar form of uh, expressing their disagreement, their protest. And this was so-called uh, defenestration. You may see here in this picture. Uh, defenestration uh, comes from the German word for window, fenster. And basically it is a ritual punishment in which you throw somebody out of the window, as you can see here. <clears throat> it is a ritual punishment which only had a certain tradition in Czechia. It had been tried several times, and it was basically uh, a ritual punishment which expressed that the person who is punished uh, is a disturber of uh, an enemy of public peace, uh, enemy of the public, right? Uh, so something like bad ruler, right? And since the emperor was uh, sitting in Vienna, he was represented in Prague uh, uh, by uh, his uh, uh, representatives who were sitting uh, in the Prague Castle. So on May the 23rd, 1618, the leaders uh, of, the, of the Czech protestant camp uh, rushed to the Prague Castle and they decided to punish in a ritual way uh, these uh, representatives of the Habsburg rule, these governors, <coughs> by throwing them out of the window. But after a proper trial. So they uh, staged there a proper trial in which they sentenced them as uh, enemies of the public peace to, def to defenestration. And then they threw each of them out of the window as you can see here. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, uh, all of them survived this punishment. Right? By a strange coincidence, uh, none of them was killed. By this, uh, uh, by this demonstration, and all of them saved themselves, which was a bad sign for the for the uh, for the revolt. Uh, however, the rebels uh, were reluctant to declare an open uh, uh, an open war on the emperor of in Vienna, and they actually waited until March 1619. Uh, to declare that they dethroned the Habsburg dynasty. Because in March 1619, uh, the Emperor Matthias I died, and this was the opportunity for the rebels to declare openly that they choose a different king, that they do not want Habsburgs uh, to rule Czechia anymore. <clears throat> so uh, after the death of Matthias I in March 1619, and they began to look for a different, for a different uh, ruler and finally uh, chose uh, Frederick of the Palatinate. Uh, the Palatinate is Pfalz in Germany, right? Uh, Frederick of the Palatinate was a Calvinist uh, prince 
he was the head of the Protestant Union in Germany, and at the same time he was the son-in-law of the British King James I. So it was hoped that uh, this new king would uh, help us uh, to get international uh, allies. He would secure uh, the help, the military help of uh, uh, England and Protestant princes in Germany. Uh, before, uh, his, before the election, which occurred in uh, autumn, uh, the, the estates uh, in Bohemia, estates uh, is a name for uh, this uh, aristocratic uh, body which was uh, ruling Bohemia instead of the king. So the estates uh, concluded a confederation with estates from other rebellious uh, provinces in the Habsburg monarchy. So they concluded uh, an alliance with uh, Moravia, uh, with Austria, and later with Hungary and Transylvania. Transylvania, or Siebenbürgen, uh, was a principality in the eastern part of Hungary, which was a vassal of the Ottoman Empire. Right? So they also, uh, they also joined uh, this uh, confederation of these states which was established in July 1690. However, it turned out that uh, the hopes of uh, getting international allies uh, did not materialize, right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the British King James I did not help us at all because he uh, wished to maintain peace with the Habsburgs Habsburgs reigned also in Spain, so they were, they were a, a, a dangerous uh, power. And James I, instead of that, organized uh, a meeting with the Protestant leaders from Germany in Ulm, in Ulm, in July 1620. And in Ulm, the Protestant leaders from Europe, from Germany and uh, from England, uh, concluded a treaty in which they decided that they would not help Czechia in their revolt. They would leave Frederick of the Palatinate alone. <clears throat> uh, were there any other options? Yes, they were. There, were. there, was, uh, there were the United Provinces of the Netherlands, another Czech Protestant power, but the Netherlands were bound to maintain peace with Habsburg Spain until 1621. Right? So, uh, the Dutch could not intervene in the war until 1621. <clears throat> so, this, ally, this possible ally was also uh, lost. So, at this juncture, the Ottoman Empire was the only power in Europe that was available that could help. However, the Ottoman Empire was bound by the peace treaty of Schitlaterok of 1606 to maintain peace with the Habsburg monarchy. <clears throat> what is not very much known is that this peace treaty was actually not completed when the Czech revolt actually broke out. When you look it up in the internet or when you look at uh, textbooks, you will find out that the peace treaty was concluded in 1606. Then there were some internal struggles on the Habsburg side it was confirmed in 1615, but actually, actually, the negotiations about the particular border in Hungary dragged on until 1618, because it was still not clear which villages in the, surround, in the surroundings of uh, Estergom and uh, uh, uh, a certain, certain place in Slovakia, uh, whether they would belong to the Ottoman Empire or uh, to, uh, to the Habsburg monarchy. So when the Czech revolt broke out, these peace negotiations were still not finished. <clears throat> uh, the, the Ottoman Empire was reluctant to join the war. They did not want to fight in this situation, but their vassal, the prince of uh, Transylvania, Gabor Bethlehem, uh, wanted to exploit the situation for his own profit. He wanted to uh, conquer Hungary for himself and become the king of Hungary. Uh, however, he could not do this without the permission from uh, Istanbul. 
In July 1619, he was given the permission to intervene, and he really attacked present-day Slovakia, and uh, finally uh, proclaimed himself the governor of Hungary. The Ottoman Empire did not allow him to crown himself the king, so this was something which they would not allow him to do. <clears throat> so how was the fighting in Czechia going on at this juncture? Uh, the Czech rebels uh, experienced uh, successes and failures. They had a big success right at the beginning of the, of, the, of the revolt, when they pushed off the military offensive of the Habsburg army in 1618. Then they were defeated in a major battle in Zabadi in South Bohemia in 1619, but their situation was saved by victory in Dolní Vistonice in Moravia in 1619. They even threatened Vienna, they laid siege on Vienna. Uh, they had allies inside Austria, because uh, the states, the nobility in Upper and the Lower Austria uh, rebelled too. So their situation was not that hopeless. However, they had lack of finances, no allies, whereas the Habsburgs had the support of the Catholic League in Germany. The Catholic League was um, an alliance of smaller German princes led by Bavaria. And the Habsburgs had also uh, the support of Habsburg Spain, which was a major superpower of the time. And with this financial and military support, the Habsburgs put together a huge army which invaded Bohemia in uh, the autumn 1620. They marched on until Prague, where they uh, met with the rebel army in the battle on the White Mountain, and the rebels were defeated. So this battle on uh, November the 8th, 1620, was the decisive uh, turning point, the decisive defeat. Uh, the fight went on in uh, Silesia, and there were some pockets of resistance in southern Bohemia, but uh, the revolt was lost. <clears throat> now, uh, the second point of our lecture, what were the ties of the Czech leaders to the Ottoman Empire? Was the idea of a Turkish alliance, as they call it, was it a dream? Was it something that they could not support with uh, any knowledge, with any, with any experience? Actually, the leaders of the Czech Revolt included several personalities who had personal experience of the Ottoman Empire because they visited uh, the Middle East uh, in their youth uh, on travels. Some of them even stayed here for a longer time as diplomats. And these were ma mainly these three people I, uh, I mentioned here. Turn, the military commander of the revolt, Budovets, the leader, leader of the Hasside nobility, and Harant, who was an intellectual and musician. Beside, aside from that, uh, there was also a lot of literature on the Ottoman Empire available in Bohemia. Mainly a uh, chronicle of the Turkish wars written by Paprotsky uh, Zlohol, uh, and there was also an anonymous uh, chronicle of the Ottoman Empire um, published uh, at the end of the 16th century. <clears throat> Uh, aside from that, uh, Czechs participated also in the Habsburg diplomatic missions to the Ottoman Empire. They started after, 50, after the truce of 1568, which was the beginning of regular diplomatic relations between uh, Vienna and Istanbul. <clears throat> the most important of them was the mission of Joachim of Sinzendorf, uh, who was in Istanbul from 1577 to 1582, and in this mission, Budovets participated. Uh, another important mission was uh, the mission of Frederick von Grefitz in 1591, uh, in which a Czech uh, no a nobleman called Václav Vratislav Zmitrovic participated. <coughs> so, Vratislav. Uh, this was a very unhappy mission because uh, Another war between the Habsburg Empire and the Ottoman Empire broke out 
why were they, they were in Istanbul, so they were arrested as uh, kind of hostages, and some of them were even uh, enslaved, some of them died uh, in prison. Uh, Vatislav uh, of Mitrovice was uh, also enslaved and uh, sent, sent to Galis to uh, work on the vessels, but he was uh, liberated in 1593 and uh, returned to, back to Czechia, where he wrote down his uh, memoirs, which are today very, very much famous. Every educated Czech knows them, but actually uh, his memoirs was not printed uh, at the time. Uh, so his contemporaries did not know about uh, this fascinating narrative which uh, he wrote down. Uh, aside from these missions, which uh, diplomatic missions, which went straight to Istanbul, there was also an important diplomatic uh, mission to Persia, in which also uh, a Czech, a German-speaking Czech uh, from uh, Sudetenland uh, called uh, Georg Tektander participated. Uh, this mission uh, took place in 1602, and the aim of this mission was to uh, find allies in Persia against the Ottoman Empire. But it was in order to bypass the Ottoman Empire, the mission had to go through Russia and then to the south to Persia. And most of the members of this mission died on the journey. Like most, uh, most of them died. Pektander was the only surviving member. And uh, after he returned, he published his uh, memoirs uh, called Iter Persicum, which was uh, published in 1608. And so this uh, travel narrative was uh, known to the contemporaries. It was not about the Ottoman Empire, but he uh, told there something about the world of Islam and uh, these uh, distant Middle East countries. Now, uh, let us have a closer look, closer look at uh, the three uh, leaders of the Czech Revolt who had personal ties to the Ottoman Empire. I would like to say a few more words about uh, their travels in the Ottoman Empire and uh, the reports which uh, they published, or some of them published. So, the most important of them is Václav Budovec of Budova. He was a, a nobleman, uh, he was uh, not Catholic, uh, but he was not a Lutheran either. He was a uh, Hasan, Utrechtist, as they were called at the time. This was the old, original Czech version of uh, Reformation. <clears throat> uh, he participated in this diplomatic mission and stayed in Istanbul from 1577 uh, to 82, and he had here important conversations with uh, converts to Islam, who were actually Europeans, who betrayed their religion and converted to Islam. And uh, these conversations uh, uh, hear, hear how some people are superficial in uh, their approach to religion. And this is why he wrote a book called anti Quran. Uh, which was uh, actually a critique of Islam, but it was uh, actually a disguised criticism of this of this uh, superficiality in religion, which was actually aimed also against Christians. Right. <coughs> uh, I will say more, more uh, something more about this about this book. Uh, next, there is Matthias Heinrich Thurn, who was also German speaking. Most Czechs do not know that. <clears throat> and uh, he was uh, he visited the Ottoman Empire in uh, his youth. He made a kind of grand tour, whereas other aristocrats went to France. He went to the Ottoman Empire, right? So uh, he made a great journey uh, to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, and then Egypt, uh, and then returned back. Uh, he was very important during the revolt because he was the military commander of the rebel army. And finally, there is uh, Krzysztof Harand of Polžice, who made also a kind of grand tour uh, to the Ottoman Empire uh, in 1598-99. to 99. He also went to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, and then to Egypt. He did not visit uh, Istanbul, right? So he actually did not uh, get to know the mainland, uh, the present-day Turkey. He went uh, slightly more to the south, uh, to the Arabic lands. Uh, after he returned, he published uh, his uh, travel account, 
uh, under the title Putovani, the journey, the journey, and it was published in 1608. It was uh, a book in, uh, which served as a main source of first-hand information on the world of uh, Islam in the Middle East uh, for the Czech reading public. Now, a few more words about anti Quran written by Václav Budovec of Budova. Budovec of Budova did not write any political tracts. You know, so he did not write anything about his, the, the reasons why he, uh, why he uh, disliked the Hasbergs or anything about uh, the freedom of uh, religion. He wrote uh, his main work was this uh, work about uh, religion, which was, as I said, even though it is called anti Quran, it was actually uh, against the superficiality in religion. It was against the hypocrites uh, inside the Christian community who took religion so lightly that they betrayed it and converted to Islam. Uh, it is, uh, the, the book is uh, decorated with uh, many interesting pictures which actually explain uh, the ideas of the author. Uh, I, uh, selected here some of these pictures. Uh, the first of them shows this idea of uh, fighting the inner spiritual struggle against the uh, hypocrisy, uh, against the lower uh, desires inside us, right? So this is uh, the spiritual night, spiritual night, which is based on uh, the uh, on, uh, on the New Testament of the Bible, on the letters of Saint Paul. Uh, to Ephesus and uh, to Corinthia, uh, in which, uh, in which uh, Paul describes uh, the idea of a Christian knight as someone who is fighting mainly against himself, right? So what you see here is a very particular uh, expression of this idea. This is a Christian knight who has the armor of Christian faith. He is holding a mirror in his hand. This is the Gospel. And he looks at the Gospel to see himself. And he is armed with a shield of uh, uh, Christian faith. Uh, the next picture uh, shows uh, another aspect of this uh, spiritual fight. Uh, the Christian knight is uh, on a, a boat, uh, traveling across the Sea of Sin, and below are his enemies. These are uh, Gog and Magog, like the figures of the evil. Then this wolf uh, is. Uh, uh, heretics, heretics who betray the Christian religion, and then this uh, skeleton is death. So betraying one's religion is like death. <clears throat> On the other side, you see the devil, and then two women, women figures, which uh, is express uh, the worldly temptations, like the world and uh, the body. So this is his, his uh, idea of temptation. And this is another expression of this uh, uh, spiritual fight, <clears throat> which is actually so uh, detailed that it is not almost uh, fine. Uh, this picture shows the spiritual fight as fight against the sin. The sin. So the sin is this uh, wolf uh, in the middle of this picture. <clears throat> as you see, here is the knight on the one side and the Christian priest on the other side who are both fighting the sin with a source of a Christian faith, but uh, to make the idea more, uh, uh, more, uh, more uh, clear, you see here even two canons, two canons, which are the faith and the gospel, with uh, other two uh, Christian warriors who are literally firing, firing at, the, at the sin uh, from the canons of uh, Christian, Christian faith. <coughs> Uh, so now uh, let us proceed to the particular questions of, to the third point of our present lecture, to the particular issues of how they made contacts uh, with uh, the Ottoman leaders in Istanbul. So it should be remembered that even before the Czechs made any attempts at uh, establishing contact, uh, contacts in Istanbul, there were Transylvanian diplomats working in Istanbul for themselves. Transylvanian diplomats uh, represented uh, the Prince Gabor Bethlehem, whom I mentioned before, who was eager uh, to conquer Hungary for himself. 
you can see him here uh, in this picture. So this is Gabor Batra. <coughs> Uh, so these diplomats were actually already working for the Czech uh, rebellion, for the Czech revolt uh, in Istanbul. It was only uh, after the election of uh, Frederick of the Palatinate in October 1619, uh, after his election uh, as the Czech king, that uh, the Czech leaders uh, started their own direct negotiations in Istanbul. <coughs> Uh, they made first attempts in uh, the autumn 1619 at the border. In the meantime, Berlin was allowed to uh, join the fight to intervene. And in uh, January 1620, Berlin uh, concluded an official treaty with uh, the Czech revolt, uh, with the Czech leaders. And maybe this was the decisive moment which uh, emboldened the Czech uh, king Frederick of the Palatinate to uh, dispatch his own direct the mission to, uh, to, uh, to Istanbul. Uh, so, this is uh, one, of the, one of the pictures uh, from, uh, from Haram's travel account uh, about uh, the Ottoman uh, Empire. And uh, now, who was dispatched to Istanbul? Uh, unfortunately, Budovec, Budovec uh, z Budova was already too old to participate in this mission. He was a very old man, so he would not probably survive the journey to Istanbul. So, the Czech king dispatched uh, a completely unknown personality, a certain Heinrich Bitte, uh, probably a German, uh, who set off on his journey in April 1620. He really uh, made it until Istanbul, uh, and he even he was given uh, an audience uh, with, the, uh, with the young Sultan uh, Osman II. His anniversary in Istanbul was the Habsburg uh, uh, diplomatic uh, representative Ludwig von Mollard, uh, who, who went there after the peace negotiations, uh, as I said, were completely accomplished in 1618. Uh, but uh, Heinrich Bitter scored some success, right? He had success because uh, he returned back to Prague uh, with an Ottoman envoy, Mehmed Aga, who went to Prague to explore the situation and see uh, what are the chances of the rebels for himself. The fun fact is that when he uh, came to Prague, which is a beautiful city, uh, he was uh, given a guide whose job was to guide him through the beauties of Prague. And this guide was no one else but uh, Budovec z Budova, the outspoken critique of Islam, who was now forced by circumstances to collaborate uh, with the Ottoman side, with the Ottoman diplomats. <clears throat> now, here you see the young uh, Sultan Osman II, who was uh, reigning the Ottoman Empire at the time of the rebellion. Now, let us speak about the reasons which moved the Ottoman Empire to maintain peace with the Habsburg monarchy. Why was the Ottoman Empire, which was so successful in the, the previous wars, suddenly so reluctant to join the fight? <clears throat> uh, as I said before, they uh, allowed uh, their the vassal, Betlen, to join the, the, the fight, but they forbade him to crown himself the King of Hungary. So why was the Ottoman Empire so reluctant? Why did they maintain peace? <clears throat> so one reason were the military failures uh, in Persia. Uh, in September 1618, uh, the Ottoman armies uh, suffered defeat uh, in a, a battle against the Persian armies. <clears throat> uh, aside from that, uh, the situation, the power situation in Istanbul after the death of uh, Ahmed I in 1670, was uh, very unclear, right? There were various, there was no strong leader, and there were various power struggles, power groups, which were struggling against each other uh, about who would uh, give, get the upper hand, who would, uh, who would reign. As you know, uh, immediately after the death of Ahmed I, he was succeeded by his brother, uh, Mustafa I, who was, however, as the younger brother of the ruler, uh, kept in cage in his youth, 
So he was literally not fit for this world and he was also not fit to govern. So he was a weak leader who was toppled in 1618 and replaced by the young Osman, Osman II, uh, who was uh, the son of Ahmed, but who was very young, who was just a kid. At the moment when he ascended the throne, he was just 13 years old, I think. So he was really a kid. Even though he had, uh, I would say, good intentions, he was not in the situation to uh, push through some uh, major decisions. <clears throat> Later, he suffered some defeats in Poland, and uh, due to these factors, he was toppled in 1622. Uh, yet, as I said, there was something really happening in Hungary uh, on the frontier between the Habsburg Empire and uh, the, Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, as I said, uh, there was really some, a small intervention, military intervention. In the situation when Gabor Bethlehem's uh, uh, army was engaged in fighting the Habsburgs in present-day Slovakia, uh, the Pasha of Buda, of Buda right, the, the local governor of Buda, uh, decided on his own, without the knowledge of the leaders in Istanbul, that he would exploit the situation for himself, and he attacked a small city of Vaz on the Danube and conquered it for uh, the Ottoman Empire. This occurred on November the 4th, so a few days before the Battle on the White Mountain, and it was a success. So he uh, got the town for the Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> but since it was uh, an unapproved action on his own, he was not rewarded for this act. He was uh, removed from his office by the Sultan uh, after the fight, but the Ottoman Empire retained uh, this town. You can see uh, the, the main square of Vats in, in the picture. Now, where is Vats? How can you... Um, how should you understand uh, this, this the military situation? Here you see uh, the situation in uh, the situation in uh, on the border between the Habsburg monarchy, which is in the west, yellow, uh, the Ottoman Empire, which is uh, in the middle, and uh, and uh, Transylvania, which is Zeebrugen in uh, in um, in the east. <coughs> so. Uh, as you see, Bath is uh, here. Okay. So Vaz is uh, this one of these uh, uh, little towns uh, in, on the Danube, on the Danube uh, at the curve, at the curve which you see there. So this is a situation uh, in, a 16, in, in the later 17th century, right? In uh, 1620, uh, the Ottoman territory was smaller, and what was confusing for earlier historians is that Vaz was uh, is usually considered uh, Turkish or Ottoman uh, already in the 16th century. This is partly true because this town was only conquered in the 16th century, but during the uh, last war uh, it was reconquested uh, by the Christian armies and it was even included in the peace of Shitlatrok of 1606. So this was a town which was supposed to be uh, Christian, right? So it was uh, on the basis of the uh, most recent developments uh, in the last war that this town uh, was again Christian and uh, this uh, intervention, intervention of the Pasha of Buddha changed the situation on the border and uh, got conqu conquested uh, the conquered the uh, town of Vaz for the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, retained this town uh, until uh, the Great War of 1683. Uh, so, this is all from my side. Uh, the Czech Revolt was the first opportunity for peaceful, uh, friendly collaboration between the Czechs and the Ottoman Empire, uh, it failed, it failed, uh, but it was like uh, an important event 
uh, which uh, I would say almost involved the Ottoman Empire in the Thirty Years' War. Uh, so, at least now you know that uh, the Czech Revolt was the beginning of the huge power struggle in Europe, which is called the Thirty Years' War. And thanks to Czech attempts, later uh, diplomatic attempts, the Ottoman Empire was almost involved in this, in this struggle. Thank you for your attention. Savaşında isyanın 
e, basıldığını ifade etti. Ondan sonra da Osmanlı Devleti ile bunlar ilişkilerin az önce Ramazan Hocam'ın değil biliyorsunuz. Yani bu Çeklerle Osmanlı arasında ilişkiler 16. yüzyıla kadar gidiyor. Takım diplomatlar geliyor, bazı kişiler kutsal toprakları ziyaret ediyorlar, Kudüs'ü vesaire. Bunları Osmanlı hakkında bilgisi var. Yani bunu bu şeylerden gördük. E, neticede İslam döneminde de bir takım temsilciler İstanbul'a geliyor. Daha o arada şeyi unutmayalım. Transilvanya, yani Erdem, Prensi, e, Betten Gavor'un kendi hesabını aslında Macar kralı olmak için bu hadisinden istifade etmek istediğimizi anlattı. E, Osmanlı Devleti'nde onun kendisini Macar kralı ilan etmesine karşı çıktığını ifade etti. Bu kişilerin Osmanlı ile kurduğu ilişkilerden bahsetti. Tabi İstanbul'da hapsulukların da esisi var, o da yandan karşı için uğraşıyor. Osmanlılar da Mehmet Ağa diye birini gönderiyorlar. Bırak duruma bakıyor. E, fakat tabi o zaman Osmanlı Devleti'nin içinde bulunduğu durum bu kısa izah etti. Malum 1617'de aslında kendisi de çok küçük olan 1. Ahmet vefat edince önce yerine küçük kardeşi, ondan küçük kardeşi Mustafa geçiyor. E, tahtı e, yönetmeye elverişli değil gibi bir ifade kullandı. E, Sayın konuşmacı biliyorsunuz birinci Mustafa nakli dengesi pek yerinde değildi. Sonra çok çocuk yaşlar ikinci Osmanlı başa geçti. Yani Osmanlı'nın merkezinde de problemler vardı. Onun için buna müdahale edemek yok. Bir İran'da olan o dönemdeki sıkıntılar yüzünden böyle bir şey. E, özet yapayım ben de kısaca size. Yani tabii ki 45 sayfa e, dakikayı 5 dakikada kısaca özetlemiş oldum. Sorular olacak mı Ramazan? Evet, evet. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much. I agree to summarize your conference uh, to the students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Teşekkürler Sayın Dekanım. Bu daha iyi bir özet oldu. Daha kapsamlı bir özet oldu. Yine bile. Şimdi... Uh, our uh, professor Benedos has just summarized very well. Arkadaşlar şimdi soru ve cevap bölümü olacak. Sorularınız varsa lütfen sorun ben çevireceğim. İngilizce de sorabilirsiniz tabii ki. Konuşmacıya yönelik sorularınız varsa konuşmayla ilgili. Um, yok gibi görünüyor. O zaman ben e, e, teşekkür ediyorum hem doktor e, sorun hem de e, ne sizlere dinlediğiniz için. Tabii ki e, sayın elçimize e, I would like especially thank you Mr. Ambassador for uh, organizing in this collaboration for organizing this talk. Uh, o zaman e, biz e, Kendilerine teşekkür bağlında We have a very modest gift to give them for their uh, help in organizing this event. Um, Mr. Ambassador, please.
uh, uh, uh, talk about, about the Thirty Years' War, or what later became known was as the Thirty Years' War, which in itself was a cataclysm, cataclysm which affected uh, the fate of nations for, for, for centuries after, and that goes to for the Czech nation. And you heard some of the uh, you know, ramifications uh, of what happened then in 1620. Uh, from from the Zema. So uh, with this, I once again thank the leadership of the university and also to yourself. And uh, hopefully, this is not our, this is not the last time that we are able to, to cooperate between the embassy and, uh, and, and the university of Manchester, uh, and possibly also between the South uh, South Bohemian University of Czech and uh, and their Turkish partners like uh, the University of Manchester. So once again, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. 